Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Our sermon text for our meditation this morning is our Gospel lesson recorded for us in the Gospel of St. Matthew, the fifth chapter beginning at the 13th verse. I invite you to please rise for the reading of the life of our Lord. And Jesus speaks these words. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its flavor, how will it become salty again? Then it is no good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by people. You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket. No, they put it on a stand and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine in people's presence, so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. Amen, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not even the smallest letter or even part of a letter will in any way pass away from the law until everything is fulfilled. So whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and experts in the law, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Lord, these are your words, and therefore they are your truth. We ask that you'd increase our faith through them. Amen. You may be seated. Dear fellow redeemed, is the law good or bad? You know, in our Lutheran church, we often stress the importance of law and gospel ser sermons and really understanding the distinction between law and gospel. We talk about the gospel as the good news. It's the good news that Jesus has come to live and to die for us and that through faith in him, we know that our sins are forgiven and we have the certain hope of everlasting life. The gospel makes us feel good. It brings peace to our hearts and joy to our lips. But what about the law? Is the law good or bad? When we hear God's law, doesn't it often make us feel bad? As it tells us what to do or what not to do, as it tells us also how to be. As we compare our own lives and our own record compare with the law, we really don't feel so good. It makes us feel terrible. It makes us feel guilty. It makes us feel as if we have fallen short. So is the law good or bad? Well, it would be good or bad to tell someone not to murder or not to commit adultery or not to steal. It would be good or bad to tell someone not to gossip or to honor authority not to covet other people's things. I think everyone would say those are very good things to encourage people to do, right? The law is ultimately good. The law serves a good purpose as well as it shows us our sin and our inability to save ourselves. This morning we consider that truth then, that the law is good. As we see that Christ came to fulfill the law, and we see that he also encourages us to obey the law. Sometimes we might think that Jesus is kind of this anti-authoritarian figure as he speaks for the little guy and, and, and speaks truth to power. As we see him in his ministry at times confronting the religious leaders, we think about how Jesus sometimes would, would poke them a bit. How he had intentionally heal on the Sabbath day because he knew they said that was wrong. How he had no problem with his disciples picking grain on the Sabbath either. While bringing the ire of the religious leaders. And so we might think that was Jesus' purpose. His purpose was to basically say, God doesn't care about the rules. You see, you people that are so caught up in obeying all of these rules, well, God isn't worried about those things at all. However, that's not the case. We see in our lesson for today what Jesus says. He says, do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. He goes on to say, until heaven and earth pass away, not even the smallest letter or even part of a letter 
Will any way pass away from the law? And whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. As Jesus clearly shows that he didn't come to get rid of the law. In fact, we see right after this, Jesus goes on in his Sermon on the Mount to go even further than the religious leaders. The religious leaders of his day had instructed people as long as they were outwardly obedient to the law, they could obey the law. For example, if you didn't actually commit murder, well, you had obeyed the fifth commandment. And if you had not been unfaithful to your spouse, well, you had obeyed the sixth commandment. But Jesus goes on in his Sermon on the Mount to explain that whoever is angry with his brother without cause or whoever causes his na him names in that anger is guilty and worthy of judgment. And he even says whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. As it seems that Jesus is doing the opposite of getting rid of the law, it seems like he's adding more details to it. So if that's the case, if Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, to get rid of the law, well, what did he come to do? And how can he possibly save without destroying the law? In our world today, a solution has been brought up by some how to deal with crime. I remember hearing that there's a particular state that their legislature has now decided that they are going to change the rules and the law concerning shoplifting. And one is able to shoplift up to $950 worth of merchandise and it will only be considered a misdemeanor. So people can be expected that they won't be arrested for committing such crimes, nor will they likely be prosecuted. To some, it seems that that's the solution to the problem of the crime rate. Well, simply decriminalize crime and that solves the problem, right? Or does it? As it may appear on the books that the crime rate has gone down, but I know of plenty of examples in that state where it seems that that sort of activity has actually increased. People have been more bold to shoplift, and to shoplift quite a bit of merchandise as long as it's under that $950 threshold. And what does that do? Well, even though you might say that that's not that serious of a crime, even though the legislature wants to say, let's not worry about those things, it still very much so does damage, doesn't it? And even if those legislatures, that legislature was to say that it's not a crime at all, it would still harm the store owner, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it still harm those that are employed at that store that has to shut down and the people that live in that neighborhood that are no longer able to get the goods that they need? So close at hand? As as much as our world thinks that the solution to the, the problem of people breaking the law is simply just change the laws and then we don't have to worry about it, that doesn't work, does it? In some ways, it, it reminds me of William Shakespeare's famous line in his play Romeo and Juliet, a rose by any other name would be just as sweet. So also a, a sin by any other name, a crime by any other name would be just as terrible, right? Because it still does damage to one's neighbor. So we see in our lesson for today, Jesus doesn't come to destroy the law, does he? In fact, Jesus says that the demands of the law are great. He goes on at the very end to say, Indeed, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and experts of the law, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. No, he isn't squishy on the law, is he? He's firm. And he says that you must be righteous. In fact, God's word demands, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And without holiness, no one will see the Lord. But who can possibly keep those commands? We think that the only solution to the problem is for God to, to maybe waffle on his commands a bit and let us sneak by. But God has a different plan, a different solution, doesn't he? As God's law remains intact, in full force, but Christ has come not to abolish the law or destroy the law, he has come to fulfill it. 
And he has done that in every way. He's obeyed the law in every thought, word, and action. And he hasn't done it merely as our example, but he has done it as our Savior. He has obeyed the law perfectly because you could not. And it's both minutest detail. He's obeyed every bit of it because God demands it of us, of you. But he's done it for you. That he might give to God that perfect record, that perfect and holy life that God demands of each of us. Jesus has accomplished it, and he has offered it to God on the cross. And he has promised that everyone who believes in him now receives his holiness, his righteousness. And that through faith in Christ, we are clothed in that holiness and righteousness. So that God no longer sees our sin, but he sees only Christ's perfection and holiness in us. And how can we be sure? How can we be sure that God has accepted Christ's life on our behalf? Well, it's because of the resurrection, isn't it? Because God raised Jesus from the dead, we can know that he has accepted his holy life in our place and for our sin. And that really changes everything, doesn't it? We think about that state legislature wanting people to maybe reduce the level of crime in their community, in their state. I thought the solution was to simply change the law. How do you get people to do what is good and right? It's not by changing the law, it's by changing the heart, isn't it? And we see that, and we'll consider that in the next part of our sermon this morning. We go back to the beginning of our lesson and know what Jesus says there. He says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. And the first thing I want you to notice there is what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, be salt, be light. He doesn't say, strive to be salt, strive to be light. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He's talking to believers here, people who trust in him as their savior. He's saying, you are already salt and light. You are different through faith in me. What's he bringing out here? When we think about the purpose of salt, salt is used to flavor things. It can also be used to preserve food. Salt can be used as a cleanser. We think of in Minnesota here, we use it to to put on our ice and melt the ice as well. What happens though, if salt is no longer salty, it it doesn't have that purpose and use anymore, right? It's, It's no different than sand. It's good for salt to remain salty, to be what it is. So how does Jesus apply this? Well, we more clearly see it in his next illustration as he talks about us as the light of the world. Now, for us in our our modern world today, it's so easy just to flip out a light switch, isn't it? And and it quickly illumines a room. But back in Jesus' day, it would have been much more complicated, a few more steps to get light, right? You have to have a, uh, a lantern or a torch, and you have to have some sort of fuel for it. You'd have to have some sort of flame as well. It was a bit more of a process than simply flipping on a light switch. Why would someone go through all of that trouble to create light? Well, isn't it because they want to illuminate a room, right? Somebody wouldn't simply go through all that trouble just to put it under a basket, as Jesus says. So too, God has a purpose making us salt and light as believers. And he explains it in our lesson for today. He says, Let your light shine in people's presence so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You know, we oftentimes talk about uh, shining our light in this world as in sharing the gospel, sharing the good news of salvation. And that certainly is one aspect of this life that, uh, light that we could talk about. But Jesus really focuses on something else, doesn't he? He says, so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. He talks about our good works as the way in which we illumine the world, the way in which we flavor the earth. And so what are good works? Well, first of all, good works are things that are done in faith. The Bible clearly says without faith it's impossible to please God. Secondly, good works are things that are done according to God's commands. 
So it's not like what the Pharisees did, that they simply made up their own rules and then followed them and thought that they were doing what is good and right. No, good works need to be done according to what God commands. So putting a solar panel on the top of your house doesn't count, right? Or you think about the third aspect of good works. There are also things that are done quite often to benefit our neighbor. We remember that as we did it for the least of these brothers of Jesus, we do it for him. So as we show kindness and love to those in our world, we illuminate. A number of months ago, a teacher at one of our Christian day schools told me a story of a young man who came into the classroom where she worked. This young man was transferred in by his parents who wanted him to now go to a private school. They themselves were not religious. Um, they, they didn't care about church whatsoever. Yet they wanted him to have this private education, and so he came. According to this teacher, that it was quite difficult to have this student in the classroom. And he often would speak out of line and bully other students, maybe at times say bad words, and it's very difficult to teach him, especially as they go through the Bible stories. And the teacher would talk about how God created the world, and he'd speak up, no, it came about by evolution. It's very difficult to have this boy in the classroom. But that teacher noticed something months later. She noticed that that boy completely changed. Completely changed. As they went through the Bible stories, he began asking to hear more. He began talking about his Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he had done for him. And there was a huge difference in his behavior. As he was kinder to his fellow classmates, as he respected the rules and the teacher. So what was the change that had taken place? Well, the teacher knew. The boy had come to faith. He had come to believe in his Savior, Jesus Christ, and she could clearly see it in him. The same is true for you and for me, that a change has taken place in each and every one of us. God has brought us to faith in Jesus. We know that he is the one that has paid for all of our sin. He is the one that gives us the gift of eternal life, the certain hope of heaven. And that changes us so that we are different from the rest of the world. It it leads us to want to live different lives, lives filled with good works, good works of kindness and love toward our neighbor, at home and in the workplace, in the classroom, in our neighborhood, and everywhere else. That change has taken place in us. It's a change that God has brought about, and he encourages us to live in that change and desire to do good works according to his commands. But what if we fail? And so often we do, right? As many times as maybe someone can point out how excellent this child is, is behaving or this, per, this co-worker is being, there's probably so many other examples that someone could give about how selfish that person was, or how unkind, or how gossipy, or how insensitive. And certainly every one of us falls short every day, don't we, uh, of living as salt and light in this world. So where do we turn? Well, at that point, God would have us not turn to the commandments, but to turn to Christ. To remember again, he is the one who has lived holy and perfectly in our place, that he is the one who has given his life for all of our sins and made us his very own. That motivates us to live in gratitude and thankfulness all the days of our life, to live in obedience to God's commands. So what about the law? Is the law good or bad? The law certainly at times makes us feel bad, and that's a good thing. As we recognize our own sinfulness, as we recognize our need for a Savior. But the law is good. The law's demands are good. What is better is the gospel, the good news of salvation that Jesus has come to live and to die for you and for me. May that gospel message always be our motivator.
to be the light of the world, to know that we are the light of the world in Christ. Amen. I invite the congregation to please rise for the blessing. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen.